Another off and off, a playing tackle by Anna Rothnick. Got a hold of just a minute, you want a little bit of talk? I'm going to be the best of me. He's more to me than anything I've ever done in wrestling. They call this the 10th pound of gold, the championship has existed in its current proper form since 19. That was pretty hard, and look at what he's going to work now. Ooh. Hey everybody, it's Durker Time. Thank you for joining me once again for another episode of Total Extreme Wrestling 2020. Billy Corgan's NWA. Hot off a pretty damn good power, I think. Um, had a lot of stuff happening in it. Uh, we had the debut of our new Not A Cult. It's Not A Cult. I know you guys always say Durker loves his cults. He can't help but have a cult. But it's not a cult. It, it it's like a it's it's like a inverted funnel of, of of self help. You know, people at the bottom they they they're working to better themselves, and the people on the top know how to better themselves, and the people at the bottom just have to you know buy some material and and learn and and become you know enlightened. And then they can move up that ladder and they can help train other people. It's total, it's not a cult. It's not a cult. Like, like I said, it, it's it's like a like an inverted funnel system. It, it's fine. I swear it's not a cult. Totally original. <laughs> so we have that going on. Uh we have Ace Austin, our next gen uh global force champion, getting the stipulation that he is always on the line, or the title is always on the line, I should say, whenever he's fighting. We have Matt Cross was uh, um, talking to Nick Aldis backstage, some stuff going on about that. We had a whole bunch of little things going on. Obviously, our big thing right now is our champion is currently, uh, you know, injured, uh, still waiting for them to show back up. We got 13 days left. Will be well in time for them to debut again uh, at my vicious Valentine, and we'll have a good match there with them. Um, I don't think we decided. I think we did. We decide. Yes, we we decided that with that one match that uh, uh, Eddie Kingston will get a shot at that title, um, and that certainly pissed off Samoa Joe, who has decided to go through from the bottom up to make everyone pay. So so that's pretty cool. Now, a couple things on the back end I want to deal with. First of all, thank you everyone that responded in the comments um, a about the merchandise. I wish I just read this, and you know, sometimes it, it's, if you ever wonder, you're like, like man, it's right there. Um, when you're recording, sometimes you just don't want to take the time to read it. Uh, to, to really see what it says because you feel like it's dead air. And I, I try not to do that. So, But I, I'll just kind of enlighten some people. So we were talking about why we weren't getting worker sales. Well, it actually says it right on the damn page that I was on when asking why not. And that is that our company does not make worker-specific merchandise. And instead, the workers are allowed to bring their own and sell it during intermission. So our workers are selling their own stuff from their own their own pro wrestle tees thing. They got their, you know, whatever. We're not getting a cut of that at all. Um, so, so that's a bummer. Now, good news is we are uh, moving up here. We, we got, you know... 64% in the upgrade here um, at our next level. It's We're going to be getting around $3 per fan at live shows and $10, $10 per popularity point per region from mail order. And it will cost us a lot more money to run. Um, well, not that much more money. But in that next rung, we should see, I believe level 5 is when we will be getting, uh, we will be building our own merch for uh, our comp, our, our workers. So we'll be able to monitor that progress, um, which will be very exciting to see. We could go wrap it. Um, it costs four hundred a week uh, versus the two point oh. I'm pretty okay with the two point oh right now. Um, you know, we're we're well on our way there. We'll we'll slowly get there at two fifty. I don't know financially if if doing four hundred a week is worth it. Um, especially because we only just just made it that last month with uh with some money. It's certainly the pay per view helped 
Um, doing monthly pay-per-views seemed to be... It was counterintuitive. It seemed like it would cost us more money, but in the end, it actually made us a little more money, um, enough to kind of feel a little secure. We got a pretty good nest egg. We got you know 600000 in the bank. Um, we don't have to make money, that really, as long as we're paying our expenses and we're paying our workers. And I'm fine with not growing that amount as long as we're not losing too much of it and we can always use that for a big nest egg of when we need to do big bonuses for something if we have to pay out a contract if we gotta make an investment you know one of the things we were looking at here in our show history even though i actually i must have set this in the wrong location because we were in the loft in the southeast um and that had a 650 capacity crowd we sold out on both of those shows, which is super cool. Our um, our arena show only was previously doing five thirty, so we did a, a pretty substantial bump up here. Um, our actual capacity for that facility, I want to say, is I want to say eight hundred. I think eight fifty. So we, you know, this is where that money is good for. We can always add another seating arrangement here and, and boost that up um, as we need to. We might be running into that if we keep going the way we are, which is a great problem to have. Now, in the news, not really much happening at all. Um, B. Presley missed the stardom show. There's a new AAA mega champion. Uh, I don't think anyone... I don't think anyone got fired recently um worker leaving in 2021 any company any worker yeah not really anybody um there was a loan for takahashi we got joe red shoes left but i don't think we need another um ref as far as that would be uh, Gresham left, but, you know, he was in our tournament, and, uh, you know, we're not, we're not gonna do anything about that. Um, speaking of the tournament, we are down today, King Mo versus Chris Brooks. I get to make the decision. Um, I have to really think about it. I don't really know. Um, I have an idea of who I might want, but... You know, it's it's tough. So let, let's look at these guys real quick. Let's, so Chris Brooks is a young, works heel, has a good gimmick, um, very strong psychology, very strong technical work, um, and and fairly solid uh, back end uh, metrics here, right? So looking pretty good there. Um, popularity, he's okay. He's 20 where we are, and that's mostly because of us. Not really that famous anywhere else. He's based in Japan. Um, much more popular in Japan, of course. But not horrendously bad there for us. Good, strong technical worker. Um, very strong hand. Probably would not be a major um, champion for us or anything like that. Would be a really good hand. Uh, we got King Mo. So King Mo has much more popularity around. Um, he's got that MMA crossover kind of status, and obviously he had a stint in TNA. So, um, so you know, he, he's got a little bit of... a little bit more popularity. Uh, eight years of experience, a lot older. So his his run here would be much shorter. His technical is strong. Uh, his microphone and acting work and star quality is much higher than Chris Brooks, which would definitely put him at a big advantage, especially his menace as well. Uh, we could believably book him as like a mid-card monster in some capacity um, and probably be pretty okay. And he's got a decent popularity pretty much everywhere in the U.S. if we were going to tour. Ranked 440 in the world, uh, certainly not too bad. Chris Brooks is not ranked in the world at all yet. Uh, Chris Brooks could have a higher long-term potential for us in the sense that he might grow. Um, his microphone work's not great right now. His acting is not great. So most of, inter most of his entertainment-based attributes are going to mean that we really would need to pair him with a technical wrestler to get the most out of him. 
Um, but again, he also probably has another decade in him of, of talent, whereas uh, King Mo is pretty much on his twilight in the last three years. So it, for my decision, it's going to have to be really, do I want the short-term gain now of having a really strong uh, competitor, really strong mic work guy with the built-in popularity, or am I, you know, but I know he's probably only going to give be another year, two years, three years, um, and he might be starting to decline. Or do we jump with someone who's a little bit younger, not a young lion, though, but has 14 years of experience, so he's not going to gain as much experience as a young lion would, um, but might have a longer tenure that, uh, that, that could, uh, you know, help us within within the longer term. Um, it's a hard decision. I, I think I know what direction I want to go. I think I know what would be right for us right now. Um, so I, I, I think I've made my decision on that, and we'll we'll play it out on the show. Uh, creative, we haven't looked at in a while. I would like to like, take a look real quick just to see as we're kind of week one in February of this save here. Let's see what we're looking at. Uh, we got... Franchise pl players, Pentagon, Samoa Joe, Miro, uh, Eli Drake, and Nick Aldis. Our next big thing is we have nothing. That's scary. Um, that's interesting. These will be our future superstars, and we have none. That's interesting. It means we need, to, we need to hire maybe another round of younger talent that might have potential. Uh, hot prospects, Ty Ray. Jason Key, Chris Brooks, Zachary Wentz, and Danhausen. Um, you know, again, so we, we have Chris Brooks here being talked up as a strong uh, future younger member who's marked as future stars. Uh, talk to talk. We got Enzo, Joe, Drake, Pentagon, and Cabana. Our showstoppers, of course, are Pentagon, Joe. Austin, Miro, and Madison Eagles, which is an interesting element. Um, I, there was some talk about maybe signing some people um, from the WWE firings recently, um, which I, I, every once in a while, try to keep it kind of copacetic with the modern, even though it doesn't necessarily, even though we're behind now significantly in the real world. Um, I, I don't hate pulling those signings out, because I think it adds a nice dynamic. Um, and I was kind of contemplating grabbing, like, Billy Kay and uh, Peyton Royce, um, because I always want more fresh faces in our women's division. Um, but I, I kind of can see doing something interesting with Matt, with uh, Thought Crimes in them, and maybe building a storyline um, to get Madison Eagles as solo, kind of. And, and break up the team squad and, and, and make, make something for her. I thought that could be kind of interesting. Uh, Ring Generals, Cash, Dax, Nicole Matthews, Madison, and Pentagon, and uh, Pillman Jr., Kingston, Austin, and Devon Eriks are a white-hot momentum right now. Zicky Dice and Samoa Joe um, hurting momentum. Joe will, will be off that list pretty quickly. Interesting, we have nobody else on them who's not. Um, and then for hidden gems in the world, um, for our top five prospects, some interesting uh, moose, who I would not consider a hidden gem, uh, <laughs> but is on that roster. Um, you know, I don't disagree, but I... It, what's his contract? Like, is he just in a handshake? Huh. Huh. Interesting. I thought he was signed. I mean, yeah, yeah. That's I'm gonna let's shortlist that right now, and I we're gonna keep an eye on that. I think I could definitely see Moose playing a huge role in the NWA at some point. Uh, Dicky Mayer, who I'm not very familiar with at all, um, looks like he's working with one of our partner affiliates. Okay. Uh, again, might be an option. Uh, not a young lion. Well, it's only had four years of experience. But, uh, yeah, okay. Xander Jones, yeah. Brooke Adams, and then Mike Verna, uh, who was in our older iteration 
of this at one point. Currently unemployed. And um, decent. Good hand, I will say. But not really... I mean, he's, he's, he's got rep all the way around. Um, but not... not not spectacular. I, I could, if we could ever find a storyline that made sense to bring him in, um, I, I always kind of f- <laughs> view Mike Verna as sort of a discount Wardlow. Um, kind of fills that role. That's kind of unfair to him because he actually has a little more personality, but I think uh, Wardlow has a better top end. Um, but, you know, we had him before and he was fine. Um, we actually had a really dumb storyline way back when, because we don't have dumb storylines now, right? Um, I could see maybe bringing him back at some point. All right. Well, we took a look at that. Uh, some interesting thoughts. I, I would definitely not be opposed to doing some more hiring after we're done our, co- our tournaments and things like that. Um, we have for the Alliance, I think we have are all of our titles figured out. That's what I don't know. We have our women's heritage currently. Someone has it. Warhorse is our national heavyweight, and our heritage tag is... And okay, so all of them are taken. Um, I don't remember how this was given, what, what show that was on, but um, right now our, we have people that are, are on our show are uh, currently our alliance titles. Um, so that's that's pretty good. Um, we'll have to use something to, to kind of play into that. All right, we got a show in six days. Let's go ahead and let's get on to it. All right, we got looks like we got some mail here. Let's go ahead and take a look. Um, did I forget to? Damn it. I forgot to extend the contract. That's fine. We will extend this contract once again. Let's put it on ongoing. God damn it. All right. Well, we're not going to have the finale of that yet because one of the competitors is gone. Uh, Wentz is gone, and um, that's fine because he was part of the tournament. Um, Oh, no. You better not. You better not lose that belt at impact. What'd you have? What show you have here? How do I see the show results? I'll, I'll look them up. Um, one night deal over at uh, Championship Wrestling from Philadelphia with Enzo and Big Cass over there. Um, Effie is gone after the end of the contract. And we have a one night deal with uh, GWF. So some some movement going on here, um, which is interesting. I don't think they had their shows yet, but we could see. No, I don't see those. Um, I'm trying to think how to find that. I don't see match history, maybe. Um, yep. The Warhorse defeated Matt, uh, Michael Elgin to retain the Alliance title on Impact, uh, which is cool. Who else was on a show? Um, it was um, Enzo and Big Cass probably retaining their their match to but we could take a look for their title. <laughs> Alex Renz- Reynolds and Enzo and Cass defeat Matt Tremont and Desquad. That's a weird, uh... Um, do they have... What, what that, what? Oh, that was on power, okay. I was confused. That, that's a weird signing match, but sure. Okay, yeah, why not? All right, let's let's go ahead and let's book our show, and uh, let, let's move this story forward. We are auto-booked in the correct venue this time, which is good. We have a backstage incident. Um, shouldn't be a problem. 
Yep, Finley just helped with creating a relaxed atmosphere. He had a hell of barbecue outside and cooked for everyone. How nice is that? Uh, absent workers, probably Pentagon. Yep. Um, Pentagon's been hard to keep in um, on the show. He's just generally never available for us, which has been part of the problem. One of the reasons why we kind of moved through the Pentagon story so quickly had a lot to do with that, just not being able to pull him in. Uh, Pillman, still out injured. We can go ahead and let's um let's fire an open form. Uh, we got some people that are irritated, and I'll let them kind of talk. Going to do a little bit of a hit on our show, um, but not not substantially, and it'll be fine. What we had on the last show, uh, East Austin fighting Pentagon and retaining the uh, Global Force Championship after having an interference with his team, the Smoking Aces. Uh, Thunder Rosa was super fired up, and. Uh, Pretty pissed off about um, the championship, wanting a shot at it, uh, beating the crap out of Willing Nightingale in the process. Uh, we had uh, Bo Dallas, who's not Bo Dallas, uh, the Austin Bowden Taylor, I believe, uh, is the name that we gave him. Talking about his weird New Age cult. It's not a cult. It's not a cult. It's not a cult. I don't. I. I didn't write that. It's not a cult. Someone got him. No, it's not a cult, guys. Guys, stop. Um, Allison got attacked and uh, was saved by Kimberly and Delilah. And uh, Joe started to kind of move his way up the ladder. So we didn't have any Eddie Kingston story beats here. So we might have to do something with him on this show. We'll kind of figure that out. All right, let's get on with the show. Start booking it and we'll be back for another episode of Power. All right, everybody, we got a whole 95 minutes in the bag. A lot of story stuff going on, so let's not even really beat around the bush, and let's just get right into this show for another episode of Power. We start off with uh, with our buddy here, Eddie Kingston and Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett opens the show in a backstage promo. He asks Eddie Kingston to enter his office, which he does. Uh, from the camera, we see that the desk has quickly been taken over by various Jeff Jarrett uh, historic memorabilia. You got your your cowboy hats. You got pictures of him and his dad during the TNA NWA days. You got um, Global Force Gold logo. You know, you got, you got all, all the kind of the hits from Jeff Jarrett. He's clearly kind of made that desk as general manager home um, very quickly. And he he greets Eddie. He's smiling. He seems happy. Uh, not Eddie. <laughs> Jeff Jarrett. Um, he says, you know, th thanks for coming in, Eddie. Why, why don't you have a seat? And, you know, I, I don't... I don't tell... Don't let anyone hear this, okay? But, uh... You know, you really are my favorite ro member of the roster. You're my favorite wrestler. You're really a wrestler's wrestler. I, and I really respect that. Eddie looks at him as though uh, Jeff Jarrett's words just kind of ring hollow. Um, he sees right through his snake oil he's trying to sell. Eddie just kind of scowls back and goes, so what do you want? He already kind of knows something slimy this way comes. Jeff leans back in his chair a little bit says, well, I I just wanted to give you a heads up. You know, I, I've been following the medical team, and I've been following Pillman's recovery, and I, I'm not sure if he's really going to be ready to have a fair match. And if he can't compete at the level that I can accept, well, I'm, I'm going to have to delay the match. And, and that means I'm going to have to restart, reset the number one contendership as well. Eddie slams his fists right down on the desk. Bullshit. You just don't want me to beat his ass. You just want your pretty boy as champion. Jeff sighs and goes, Listen, I'm a businessman. The company, before it was Billy Corgan's, was my legacy too. My father's legacy. I just... I just want to make sure that we don't tarnish it. 
I want to make sure that we have all the right pieces in place. I want to make sure if the matches need to happen that they're fair and to give all the people the right shot to win. Eddie doesn't really take anything he says to heart. And Jeff Jarrett kind of just gives him a good, good luck in your match tonight, Eddie, as he walks away. So um, Eddie was actually poor when improvising the dialogue here, which is kind of interesting. Um, so Jeff Jarrett did a fantastic job. Got the show to a crowd, a strong start, and got the crowd hotter. Uh, Saban gets a 59, and we're left with a weird situation. Again, Jeff Jarrett just doesn't quite make sense. It feels like he's a heel one week and a face the other. Maybe he really just cares about the legacy of the NWA, um, or maybe he has something else in his sleeves. Um, but there definitely seems to be a, a animosity uh, between him and Eddie, even though it seems like Jeff at, at the face doesn't want to say that he's reciprocating it. Um, kind of an interesting dynamic between the two. We have another squash match for Samoa Joe. Uh, it's pretty damn quick. Joe had a 75, and our local jobber, Killer Nichols, had a 24, and uh, it was such a severe beatdown that Nichols actually got a twisted knee from it. Uh, Joe ends it with a submission. Gets us a 41. Yeah. And afterwards, Samoa Joe grabs a cameraman who is on the ring apron and rips the camera right out of his hands um, to bring it to his face uh, with such force that the cameraman actually stumbles off of the apron and takes a bump from it. He stares deep into the camera, face square with it, eyes blazing white hot with intensity. And he scowls and talks right to Jeff Jarrett th uh, through the uh, through the camera. He says, "Enough jobbers, enough fodder." Jarrett, I know you're watching this feed. I want a real challenge. If I don't get a real roster challenge in the next minute, I am going to fight anybody, crew, announcers. I don't care. I'm going to make people hurt. After a tense minute goes by, and just about. He's just about when he's about to make do on that promise. Eli Drake comes out, ready to brawl. The two have at it, leading to a fight that's inconclusive to the back as they fight their way backstage. Um, seemingly, Eli Drake, to answer the call, um, not sure if he was sent out by Jarrett or if he just wanted to uh, protect the crew, um, but definitely Eli Drake's been known to have a chip on his shoulder, so he might have just kind of ran out there to uh, stop Joe from having an onslaught. Eli Drake was superb with his mannerisms. Um, we had him set as entertainment, so maybe he said some stuff beforehand. But uh, either way, the segment is fantastic. It's 74. Joe played in perfectly. Drake played in perfectly. Um, and we start the uh, storyline between the two of them. Well, more, more Joe. Um, we don't know how long... I mean... It's clear that Joe is going to, to propel himself to the top. It's really a question is, is Eli Drake a, you know, a road bump or is he a full stop? And that's what we're going to have to find out. Speaking of squash matches, poor Jason Cade has a very quick match with Ricky Starks. Well, actually, it's not that, that, actually, I should say it's not a squash match. It's actually a pretty competitive match. It's a 12-minute match. Uh, Ricky Starks gives Cade a Buster Keaton did not have much heat, but it had pretty decent wrestling. Ricky Starks had a 47. Jason Keed had a 39. Got the crowd buzzing. Um, leaves us with a 44 and another win for Starks. Um, this is actually timed incorrectly, but... Oh, actually, it might not be. Um, so, after the match, uh, Ricky Starks' former partner, obviously now down in the outs and having left the kingdom, um, holding a crumpled up pamphlet in his hands that he was given by from Nick Aldis. Um, he knocks on a door, and this camera rolls up to reveal that it has the Satori Initiative logo on it. Um, door opens up, and he walks inside and closes the door, uh, seemingly joining this Satori Institute of Learning and Enlightenment and Enrichment um, to see if it can help him 
and uh, obviously uh, don't know how that's going to play in or where it's going to go, but Matt Cross does join that. Uh, we advance the uh, Satori Initiative storyline, move up a little bit in the segment rating. Um, it's not too great, but overall it's not too bad for, for who we have in there. Pretty solid match here. We got Von Erichs fighting War Machine. Uh, Von Erichs defeat the War Machine in seven minutes. Uh, Marshall Von Erich pinned a row. Ross had a 59. Marshall had a 54. Rowe had a 39. And Hansen had a 42. We start the storyline of Enemies at the Gates um, for Von Erichs. Now being champions, showing some dominance. They're looking very good out there. Got the crowd hotter. Um, they're showing great chemistry and gives us a 54 rating total. Um, and ultimately, we're seeing a, a new dominant Von Erichs. They got that that funk out of them. Uh, they kind of reunited with their father. He's not managing them anymore, but they kind of, you know, consoled. Um, and they're, they're showing that legacy starting to uh, to bloom in them and, and with, with some solid defenses, not defenses of the belt, but solid wins. That leads to FTR coming out. Um, you know, obviously, the Von Erichs are looking good. They're looking united. They're looking like real champions. Uh, they're about to go on a mic and kind of make a make an announcement or make a speech. Um, but they're interrupted by FTR, who comes out. And Dax grabs a mic, um, actually grabs it from the Von Erichs' hands. Um, and he tells them to slow their roll a little bit. You know, just because they beat FTR once doesn't mean they're the top guys anymore. This means they won one match. And they want a real rematch. No gimmicks, no special rules, just a real old school wrestling match. Because they don't think that FTR can do it again. Before Von Erichs can even really respond to this, Enzo and Big Cass interrupt the two groups. Enzo, elo eloquently as always, points out that they are the real G's. And they're also currently the Heritage Champions. And as champions of the Alliance, they feel that they should be involved in NWA's top tag scene as well. The three team teams end up squabbling over who should challenge who and what, um, leading to a full uh, breakdown, breakdown and a total fight. We don't know who threw the first fist, but a fist was thrown, and the entire uh, six-man group just devolves into a giant brawl. Uh, forcing staff to come out to actually break them apart and, and try to, to, to quelch this. Um, we advance this Von Erich storyline, and um, actually Kevin Von Erich is still slated to be the manager of, of FTR, which kind of is weird, but uh, whatever. Uh, we'll probably have to move him off of there. Uh, he did help Dax, though, um, in the speech that actually worked out pretty okay. And Enzo's getting better as gimmick. Uh, Big Cass still in a funk, so in matches is still a little rough for us. Uh, overall, though, this segment gets a 47, and not too bad. Delilah Doom has a tag match with Madison Eagles and Nicole Matthews, but uh, when she shows up, uh, her tag partner, Kimberly, is nowhere to be seen, um, and the match starts anyways and leads to a two-on-one handicap that ends uh, very quickly, um, and we will see that in a second here. A one minute, 36 seconds. Uh, Madison Eagles and Nicole Matthews dominate against Doom, uh, put her down real quick, and... Um, yeah, I mean, there's not much to say about it. She was missing her tag partner. Who knows where Kimberly is? Um, but the Thought Crimes is able to uh, take her down very quickly. And in fact, we do see where Kimberly is as the cameras catch up with her backstage, being assaulted by Thunder Rosa, who demanded a title shot last week, um, putting the hurt on Kimberly as she just runs roughshod over her, uh, throwing her into walls, throwing her into trash cans, everything that she can do, um, and pretty much laying her out backstage. We actually lose heat, though, with the women's championship with this segment, unfortunately. We got a match with Warhorse, our. Alliance champion versus Matthias Breeze. Um, this is a comedy match. It does its job, which is to give him a little bit of a breather. Um, 
Warhorse defeats Breeze in seven minutes, almost eight minutes, with a quick roll up. Just a just kind of just managing to survive the encounter here. Segment's only a thirty; it doesn't do great. Um, neither of them are uh, substantial performers right now. Uh, Breeze is actually a little bit off his game. That's kind of unfortunate. After the match, though, uh, after the quick roll up, Warhorse is interrupted. It's like an AEW show. There's just a thousand uh, uh, interruptions this week. Uh, Warhorse is interrupted by Ricky Starks, who makes his way to the ring with a mic in hand. And Ricky Starks kind of doing a little <laughs> clap as he kind of enters the ring. He says, War Horse. You know, we've never really officially met, have we? You know, we, we have a similar legacy. You're the guy that some people on the internet like because you make them laugh. You know, I'm familiar with your work. I also have a sort of a reputation online myself. See, I'm the guy the internet says is the future of this business. <laughs> well, you've seen. <laughs> they ain't wrong. I've proven myself everywhere I go. And I've proven myself especially in the NWA. Every match I'm in is must-see TV. I've already outpaced my old tag team partner. <laughs> I'm, I'm the future not just of my stable, the kingdom. I'm the future, period. And it's time that future is ordained. I've just grown so tired of sitting in the back waiting for an opportunity. You have something I want. I desire. I deserve it. The title says you're the best in the Alliance. Well, after watching that last match of yours, I'm not so sure about that. So I'm challenging to a title match. And I'm going to show you that the future is uh, rather bleak for you. Warhorse listens, not very happy with what Ricky Starks has to say, but being who he is, gladly accepts the match. So we have Alliance Championship match, Ricky Starks versus Warhorse, and we start the Warhorse versus Starks storyline, chip on his shoulder, uh, both of them having similar chips on their shoulder, which will be kind of interesting to see how this goes. Got the crowd or hotter. Unfortunately, it only gets us a 35. And in our main event, we have the Kingdom... Eddie Kingston and Homicide versus The Revenant, Akam, and Razor. Um, it's a good match. The Revenant actually defeat Eddie Kingston and Homicide in 16 minutes. Akam pinned Homicide while using the ropes for leverage. Um, and there actually was supposed to be a distraction in here, but it doesn't show. Um, I believe Jeff Jarrett came out and distracted Eddie Kingston, uh, freeing up Homicide to get pinned. Kingston and Homicide do not work well. As a team, that's good to know. Their timing is all over the place. And uh, Kenny Kingston's gimmick is getting stale. So we'll have to kind of deal with that at some point. Overall, though, Homicide had a 43. Kingston had a 60. And then we had a 53 and a 58 from Akam and Razor. Not too bad. Uh, we advanced the storyline. Razor, the Revenant, <laughs> advanced the storyline for the enemies of the gates because they showed some credibility, um, leading to some bit of a problem of, like, they just toppled you know, basically one of the main eventers of NWA right now, um, they should probably have a shot at the titles as well. So we'll see how they kind of feel about that whole situation. Uh, with it gives us a 57 rating. It's not horrible. Final segment of the show, 55. Again, a little lackluster for what we were starting to show off, but it's fine. Uh, Jarrett, who's out there having just talked to Kingston, wishing him luck. Um, kind of shows his snake-like colors as after having watched the match and kind of distracted Kingston a little bit, gives a little thumbs up, thumbs down to the Revenant. And the Revenant apparently are taking orders from uh, Jeff Jarrett as they pick up the two members of the kingdom and uh, plow them uh, through the ground. Uh, homicide gets thrown into the side of uh, the ring post and beat up while uh, Kingston gets beat up towards the announce table and two double team him and, you know, smash him through the announce table um, and leaving him dead. And so Jeff Jarrett kind of 
calling the shots here of saying, yeah, you you know what's going on. You you know know your role kind of situation. Um, and it seems like he's either hired the Revenant or they're, they're kind of maybe aligned with him at some point. We'll have to kind of find out. Um, but they attack the kingdom and leave him to the ground. Uh, Jarrett work, Jarrett worked the crowd well, and uh, overall, not too bad way, not too bad of a way to end the show, leaving Kingston kind of floored and unsure of his future here. Uh, music production slightly worse than one of our rivals, so we did get a little bit of a penalty there. Overall, though, we got a fifty-nine, which is pretty solid. Um, that should do very well for pretty much all the regions that we have. All right, let's see what we got here for our news. We got point zero four for that show, so not too bad. Uh, Nichols was injured, and we got a whole bunch of one night deal, and it's all the old stuff. Okay, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, overall, I think that was a pretty solid show, and I'm sure we're gonna get pretty good of a report from that. Yup, fantastic, and uh, yeah, it's not too bad. Um, you know, we're still growing slowly but surely. We're now at 47 for the Southeast, which is fantastic. Um, getting some some good forward momentum there. Um, still a long way to go, but it's a long haul. And I think, uh, I think we're in a really good spot going forward. So thank you guys for joining me for this episode of Power. We got, uh, I think, two more episodes of Power before uh, Vicious Valentine. So keep an eye for that as we make our way towards our next pay-per-view. And I will see you guys next time. Have a great one.